so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's the late 1980s, and Lynette Crimmins arrives home to her house in Perth, which she shares with her husband and three children by the sea in Sorrento. He's a former Victorian police officer, but now he is head of security at the Argyle Diamond Mine in the remote East Kimberley region of Western Australia. She doesn't usually get home at this time of day. She's just popping in to pick something up. But when she opens the front door, she's surprised to see her husband, Barry, in the kitchen. The tap's on and he's hunched over the sink. Lynette walks up behind him and wraps her arms around him in a big, squeezy hug, giving him a kiss on the cheek. But when she peers around, she realises he's washing something. Rough diamonds. She's shocked. What on earth is going on? Why are they in her house? Little does she know, this is not a one-off. Barry is embroiled in an elaborate scam that over many years will see up to $50 million worth of diamonds stolen from the famous mine. And not just diamonds, some of the rarest, most expensive jewels money can buy. They're diamonds that remain in circulation today, sitting polished and cut in engagement rings, necklaces and earrings, with the wearer likely completely unaware they're in possession of stolen goods. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist Sinead Mangan. Sinead's been telling stories from the outback for the past 25 years and has presented the ABC's national programs Dust and Dollars, Resources Beat and Australia Wide. Most recently, she's been working on a podcast that investigates the millions of dollars of diamonds that were stolen from Western Australia's Argyle Mine. Sinead, tell me about the Kimberley region of Western Australia and why it's so good for diamonds. Well, the Kimberley region of Western Australia, very top end of WA, extremely beautiful. Like, I think it's one of those places that are on people's bucket lists and usually they don't get to that stage of their lives until they're older. So the grey nomads head there in droves because they've got the money to do it and the time to do it because it is very, very remote. So if you have pictured in your mind, it's like deep, deep red gorges, waterfalls falling into huge rivers and swimming holes. I mean, some of the most beautiful swims in the world you'll have in, in and around Kononara. Stunning place. But geologically, something really interesting happened there. So you've got two Kimberlitic regions of the world. They're called the Kimberleys. You've got one in South Africa, one in Australia. And at one stage, both were joined. The reason why this is important is this is volcanic. So basically, boom, there was this huge volcanic eruption. Look, I'm not a geologist, so this is very much (laughs) in layman's terms, if we can imagine it. So basically, the volcano kind of exploded. The intensity and the heat of that created the diamonds, and they were pushed up and kind of came down in the equivalent of rivers. And that's why you find diamonds both in South Africa, their Kimberley region, and in our Kimberley region in Western Australia, you find diamonds. So that's why there are diamonds in the Kimberley region. And these diamonds, they feature quite prominently in Indigenous Dreamtime stories, don't they? They have for thousands of years. They have, and it's such a stunning thing. So Argyle wasn't the first to find diamonds in the Kimberley at all. Actually, their stories through the dream time that indigenous people found diamonds over time and they'd find them in streams and that's to do with that geological thing I was just telling you about and the story that is in and around the Argyle diamond mine which is Australia's and was the world's biggest diamond mine when it was in production and it's only finished up the last two years anyway the story is it's called the Barramundi dreaming story and the story is is that there was a big Barramundi going over the landscape as she was swimming over the landscape women tried to catch her. These three women tried to catch her. So they used this particular traditional swimming method to catch the barramundi. The barramundi got away and as the scales fell away, they were the diamonds that were been found. 
So if you can imagine a barramundi and a you know shimmery, shivery fish, this is in the podcast and then did someone from that area tells a story, which is only appropriate. So this is a version of it. So those diamonds are actually at Argot all the colors that you would see in a barramundi skin. So that's amazing. Like, cause a lot of diamonds just, you know, diamond mines just produce white diamonds, but in Argot, they're all the colors. They were amber, they were cognac, they were gin and tonic, and they were pink, just like a fish's scales. Let's talk about the pink diamonds because they're incredibly rare, aren't they? Incredibly rare and incredibly expensive. <laughs> How expensive? <laughs> like in today's yeah. terms, what would one oh, set you back? Uh, I think they've gone up something like since 2000, exponentially 600%. Whoa. So like I've been interviewing people, I kid you not. Like I interviewed a lady up in Conanara and she's got some of the most amazing collections of pink diamonds. Sat down at her desk in her back office and she's just kind of, ah, shove that to one side there, Sinead, with your microphone. <laughs> put my hand on it and it's like a 500,000 speck of a diamond. I'm <gasps> talking about like a speck and it was, I could see the numbers very close to $500,000. So they're enormously expensive. You know, if you think about JLo and Ben Affleck, I mean, I think JLo actually did put pink diamonds on the map to a certain degree for a certain generation because Ben Affleck originally, although I do realize they've got married recently. <laughs> History has come back and repeated itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but that original engagement was a pink diamond ring. And it was a really big pink diamond ring, which from memory came from Harry Weinstein. So it was only really special collectors that would get access to these really big pink diamonds that came from Argyle. And Argyle produced the most steady supply of pink diamonds the world's ever seen. You get some in Russia as well. But yeah, no, Argyle's pink diamonds are quite something. Another kind of, when Oprah Winfrey came over and she was at Sydney Opera House, she gave everyone a pink diamond in the audience, that kind of thing. What? You know, like, yeah, yeah. It's tiny though, you know. You'd have to like really strain to see the size of it. <laughs> so these pink diamonds, you were mentioning the South Africa kind of mine as well. Are they there as well or are they just significant to Australia? No, they're unique to Argyle. Wow. And that's all. I know it's you kind of probably, why is she talking about this kind of geological stuff? It's important in Argyle's story, but in this story as well, is that it was something peculiar happened geologically in WA, in the Kimberley, that produced these incredible pink diamonds that now, you know, you bang in pink diamonds into Google search and you see some extraordinary jewellery. You know, Elizabeth Taylor has worn them. They capture people's imagination and they're that, you know, if you haven't seen one, they're like a fairy floss pink. I mean, and they go all the way to like a deep, deep red, but the Argyle ones tend to be this kind of fairy floss pink thing. And jewellers love them because beside white, they look amazing. Yeah. They look really amazing. So you kind of have that contrast of colours, but the mines stop producing. So actually they're more and more expensive and there's a whole dabbling in pink diamond exchange now. That's very interesting into itself. Let's talk about the mine. So it's the Argyle diamond mine. When did that start up and how big of a kind of production did that become? It started up in the early 80s and it was a huge thing for this mine to be discovered in Western Australia. So a lot of people were looking in the 70s, but they actually started the mine in the 80s and it was soon, you know, producing a heck of a lot of diamonds. And then it was the world's biggest producer of diamonds in the world. Although pink diamonds were a very small percentage of what it produced, they became hugely popular in the 90s and then in 2000s. And they were squirreled away by collectors around the world. I know the Sultan of Brunei has a number of pink diamonds, I've been told by auctioneers. So those in the know that knew about coloured diamonds kind of bought the best that they could when they could because they were only released the really best diamonds of Argyle. They only allowed 35 people, 35 ateliers, they call them. So you're kind of equivalent of your Harry Weinsteins and um, various different people to bid on those huge diamonds. So the big ones or the really coloured ones. So what they do is someone would fly here from Perth, from Western Australia, where I'm from, and I did see this. They'd have this kind of velvety black box and they'd fly to Hong Kong and they'd open the box and people would come and have a look at them and then they'd all have to silently bid on them. So they'd silently bid on, you know, I want to bid for that tender that, you know, they put them in little packages. So they never knew what each other was going to bid for them, but they also knew that these were exclusive. So then say the Sultan of Brunei might have bought them or JLo or Ben Affleck actually. <laughs> <laughs> How do you become one of the 35? That's incredibly exclusive. So they're handpicked and there's a few in Australia, Hong Kong, all the big diamond centres. So diamond trading, just for those, I think people are familiar because of all the heist movies, but Geneva, London, Antwerp, New York, Hong Kong, Sydney, there's only a handful of big tra trading centres. This mine, it was touted at the time as being the world's most secure, wasn't it? 
certainly was. And as part of my investigation, of course, I had to look into this. You know, yeah. How did they get these diamonds out? You know, what happened? So I spoke to the man who was the head of Argyle right from the start. So we were saying that the mine started up in the 80s and he put in place the plan for Argyle. But it turned out it wasn't as secure as they thought. So there was a Victorian commissioner who was flown in after these diamonds were stolen and he had a look at the security and he was saying, look, I flew up to site. Diamonds were falling out of the hopper, which is where they kind of are collected and they're falling onto the floor and I was just picking them up and popping them back in. So needless to say, the fact that some of them got squirreled away by someone on site was probably not that surprising. And I've talked to numerous employees who said, oh yeah, but the big thing for them was if you took them, who could you sell them to? because they were obviously Argyle diamonds and they were untreated. So an untreated diamond looks like a bit of gravel, actually. It doesn't actually look that fancy or a broken piece of glass. So what were you going to do with this? You know, there's a heck of a lot of work to make a diamond look like your engagement ring there, you know. So it it is, I can see your little sparkly, sparkly. I didn't say little, your sparkly diamond (laughs) engagement ring. (laughs) Um, But there's a lot of work that gets to at that stage. But when you see a rough diamond, you know, there's a reason why they say diamond in the rough. It literally doesn't look like much. <laughs> it takes a bit of work for it to get to what we think of as diamonds. As a diamond. so, and those workers just said, you know, you would have had to have been in the know to actually know what to do with it next. Before we do get to the theft, to set the scene a bit, mining in WA at the time, how many people were interested in this profession? It was pretty damn popular, wasn't it? It was really popular. When Argyle put up the jobs for the mine, and it was going to be a fly-in, fly-out mine, which is very familiar to people now, but this was the first time this was ever done. So you you hoosh, you get everyone on a plane, you fly them to site, they spend two weeks there, and they pop on home afterwards. And then you'd have people flying in the air like opposite shifts. And people described Argyle as Club Argyle because it was they wanted it to be the place that you you know you wanted to work. So, you know, they'd have fancy meals and there was a tennis court and there was an Olympic sized pool and they wore blue <laughs> they wore blue uniforms at that time. And one of the chaps who was one of the original workers said to me, Yeah, we used to call ourselves the Smurfs because <laughs> <laughs> they'd get on the plane and off to work they'd go and you know, they literally would have crayfish for their fancy meals. Like it was the place to work and it paid really well. So lots of people wanted to work there. People were queuing out the door to get the jobs. And, you know, it was around in Perth in terms of the time. There was a lot of excitement around the mining industry and the gold industry and everything. So, you know, kind of, you got your days of big hair and champagne lunches and people doing deals. And so everyone wanted a part of this action, really. Yeah, it sounds like more of a holiday than a workplace. (laughs) I don't know. I've been on lots of mine sites. (laughs) But certainly they were making it as attractive as possible to work there. And actually, some of the workers said, well, that's possibly why things got a bit lax, because we'd all kick back with a few beers over sunset. So there was an enormous theft of diamonds. We're talking, am I correct in saying over 50 million? Well, we don't quite know. We don't quite know. And this is a very rubbery thing because it was reported at the time to be up to $50 million. But as we've been talking about, diamonds have grown exponentially since then. The other thing is, is that with diamonds, they're so teeny tiny. They're called like stealth wealth. They're like the teeniest, tiniest form of physical wealth. Like a pink diamond, as I said, a tiny one that you could barely see, $500,000. Blows my mind. So you can see why the criminal underworld get involved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you stick them in a tin of pilchards, as one person said. You know, you can stick them in and you can kind of hide them away. So that's the reason why it's very difficult to say how much was, because they only managed to get back and, you know, so many of these stolen diamonds because they flew to all those trading centers. So it's really robbery how much was actually taken. And it was up to 50 million at the time. I've seen pictures of some of the diamonds that were taken. And actually, I was speaking to a jeweler only Monday. And he looked at one of the pictures. And these were the raw diamonds that the police have given me those photos. And he's like, that's 24 carats, mate. I quickly banged it into Google, as we do. Oh, and 24 carats diamond, how much? 8.6 million. That was just one. So we could be really underestimating how much. We'll never know. We really will never know and we'll never know unless those that stole them say exactly what they took and they never, ever said exactly what they took. How was this theft first discovered? Well, this is this is fascinating. So the chap who I was saying started off security, so that was Richard Corfield. I chat to him a lot through the podcast. 
when he was setting up security, he made all these contacts and he's from Scotland Yard, very, very well connected man. And goodness, like he's in his 80s now, crystal clear memory of this time. And it would have been really stressful. But he had all these contacts. So, and like I said, the diamond industry can be a bit kind of, you know, things are done in a handshake. Like they literally like millions of dollars are done at diamonds and it's called to Mazal. So it's, and, and this is part of the Jewish tradition of diamonds is you shake hands and that's the deal done. Not necessarily paperwork or contracts or <laughs> any of that kind of oh, thing. So it's untraceable. Yeah. So it's a very unusual industry. That's what makes it so cool, I suppose. <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> yeah. So Richard, he had all these contacts and he got a call from a chap and he said, look, I've seen Argyle Pinks here in Antwerp and like all of Argyle Pinks, because they were so exclusive, they should know where they're going from the mine to where they end up. And these diamonds were kind of had escaped that system. And he said, they're popping up here in Europe. What's going on? So then Richard Corfield then starts to look into it and he makes some more calls and pushes on his contacts. And then he hears that this South African diamond cutter here in Perth was cutting diamonds for someone. So he went into the diamond shop. He basically bowled up, went, walked into the shop, said, mate, I hear you're cutting diamonds or any of them argyle. And he goes, no, 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 I've got a few here. He knew by looking at them, actually, these could be argyle diamonds. And he said, well, mate, who gave you those? And actually, there was a clue before that. The clue was, is this person who was dabbling in the diamonds in Europe, who was calling himself the explorer. So there was this kind of, it has it all. <laughs> you had the explorer in Europe saying, <laughs> trying to dabble diamonds. Meanwhile, this man here was cutting diamonds. He said, oh, who, who gave them to you? And this guy was terrified. He told him straight up, it was this man called Lindsay Rodden. And that wasn't a name that was familiar to Richard Corfield at the time. And he said, look, I'd like to test these diamonds because they can actually test them for origin. They can test exactly whether the diamonds were Argyle or not. But the diamond cutter was obviously terrified of Lindsay Rodden and said, look, mate, you know, we need to have a chain of custody. You know, you can't just take these and take them away and test them or whatever else. Anyway, between the jigs and the reels, he did. He took the diamonds, he tested them, found out they were Argyle, whipped them back before Lindsay Rodden got there. He called the police, but the police weren't particularly interested didn't show a massive amount of interest. Anyway, Lindsay Rodden rang the diamond cutter before he managed to get the diamonds back to say, I hear Argyle have my diamonds and are testing them. So that was a clue that he had an inside word. And allegedly it was the police that would have told him, by the way, this has happened. And this is where it gets murky because this character who's the main culprit, Lindsay Rodden, he was very connected in the police and that was seen through a royal commission. And Richard Corfield is hilarious when he talks about him, you know, he talks about how the way he looked and he, he was this outrageous character and how he had everybody kind of hoodwinked into his personality. And he's a very big personality in, in the story. And when we're talking about who had the contacts, he had the contacts and he pushed on those contacts in Europe and here in Australia and in Hong Kong. Who was he? Was he just a career criminal or did he have a day job? His day job was a horse trainer. Right. <laughs> very different yeah he was a horse trainer and he was known to police although in speaking to the journalists who met him he has since passed away they said he was always one of the you know when you're at the courts and you're reporting at the courts and there's always this kind of person with contacts who kind of wants to let you know that they're there he was one of those types but yet they won't say anything. They just kind of had this swagger about them. And and that's the way he was. You know, he had a bit of a smirk and he was a bit of a, and he'd always kind of have a go with the journalists as well when they'd come in. So he wanted to, to make it known that he knew people. And that was really important to him. And, and, and that was said several times over that this man kind of had connections and wanted you to know that he had connections. So it would be discovered that this theft was happening over quite a few years. This wasn't a one-shop kind of thing. No, it wasn't a one-off at all. So in the court documents, it says that the theft went for five years. We know that over 18 months, somebody on site pocketed the diamonds. We know that's for sure, but actually the court case covered five years and that was the charges that were, and it was conspiracy to steal rather than stealing charge. So the person you're talking about is a man by the name of Barry Crimmins. Yes. Now, who is he? He is a cop, right? He's a former cop. He was from Victoria. He travelled from Victoria to come to Perth with his wife and three children, took a job at Argyle. And these guys were in hot demand. They needed security on site. So if you're a former cop, excellent. You had the credentials. And Richard Corfield was his boss. So you can imagine Richard Corfield's surprise when it was finally revealed over the period of time that diamonds were being stolen and he couldn't find 
the connection, where were they coming from or whatever. And actually, Barry was inside the story. He knew what Argyle was investigating and what the police were investigating and was feeding it straight back to Lindsay Rodden because it was an inside job. That's how it happened. And the story that Barry tells in the court about when he finally took that leap and went, right, I'm going to take these is hilarious and you know we can talk about that too (laughs) why is it hilarious because the way he describes it and we have spoken to Barry but I think it's the way he described it at the time was that this bottle of diamonds which was kind of like an empty kind of coke bottle if you can imagine like so they just put the diamonds in bottles plastic bottles and there was a bottle of diamonds and had 25 diamonds in it, and it somehow escaped the paperwork. So it was sitting on his desk as head of security. It was sitting on his desk, and he looked at it, and he watched it. And I mean, as a former police officer, he would have known that it had escaped this paperwork. So you would expect that he would just make sure that it was in the chain of custody that it should have been in. Instead, he popped it in his locker, and he sat on it for another little while, and then decided to take it. So he took it. And Lindsay Rodden was somebody that he was familiar with. So he took the diamonds and smuggled them in his carryalls, in his luggage. And because he was so well known and so well liked on site, nobody checked him. He was the head of security for that shift, for that two week shift. Like he describes it in a very emotional way in the courts, you know, like in a moment of madness, you know, <laughs> the theatrics. In a fair moment of madness, though, you know, one would have to say if you're, you know, I think it's the fact that you're, as an ex-cop, there's no way you didn't know that that wasn't kosher. And it also sounds like it was a really calculated decision that he made over several days or weeks. That's how he describes it. It took a while to make that decision. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with journalist Sinead Mangan about Western Australia's Pink Diamond Heist. So he gets the diamonds out and gives them to Lindsay. Am I correct in my research in saying that they first did their their first changeover at a dog show? There is this connection of the dogs, and this is how the what they call the nexus between the two. So our gods investigating, police are investigating. They're getting nowhere. Barry's on the inside of the story because Argyle have said, look, as security, you know, who here on site could be possibly doing this? Barry's feeding this information back to Lindsay. But these two, unbeknownst to the investigators and the police, had known each other for quite some time. And the reason being, hilariously, is they all have an interest in dogs. Oh, God. So, <laughs> German shepherds, specifically. Okay. <laughs> so back when Barry was living in Victoria and Lindsay was here, they both were breeding German Shepherd dogs. So Barry and Lindsay met at the dog shows, first in Victoria and then in Perth. And they'd go to this, what they call the Kingsley Dog Show, which actually still exists. And they'd meet up there and, I don't know, talk about German Shepherds. As Richard Corfield said to me, hilarious, they were Alsatian fanciers. (laughs) (laughs) That was the nexus. That's how we found out. So that's how how it was, was that, through, you know, old school investigation, what are these connections? And somebody made mention of these dogs. And then the first investigator, Robin Foy, who is a major whistleblower in this case, and he actually left Perth because it all got very stressful in the end. There was a lot of pressure on both Richard Corfield and Robin Foy. Went through the dogs and found the Kingsley Dog Show and went, oh, they're both in the German Shepherd Club. And so were they literally doing their swaps there? Like They did swaps in car parks, in cafes, and I believe one of them was at the dog show. Yeah, wow. And where did the diamonds go from there? I guess Lindsay would then take them overseas. So Lindsay then recruited a whole load of air hostesses in Perth with his friend Michael, who they refer to as Russian Michael in the court documents, and, and those that I've interviewed also refer to him as such. He was a character in Northbridge, which is our kind of inner city nightclub kind of area in Perth. So he recruits these air hostesses in hotels in Perth. So they're flying, they're doing the connection through from Hong Kong to London or Hong Kong to Geneva or Antwerp, the various different spots. And he says, rightio, I'll give you X amount to get these diamonds from here through the various airport security and into Europe or Hong Kong, what we'll do is diamonds are very brittle. Bob's your uncle will shove them in face cream. 
Okay, it's inventive. <laughs> yeah. So they don't rub together. Yeah. So that's what they did. And then he got quite specific about the face cream. And there's good reason for this. Smart bloke. So the face cream was specific. So then if someone was going to a hotel in Hong Kong, opening up a safe, they could see the face cream there and know that was the one with the diamonds in it. So ah. there was this continuity. But in his, this is where he made a mistake though, because the air hostess has got one up on him. He used to get them to buy the face cream duty free. <laughs> <laughs> He's got millions of dollars worth of diamonds, but you've got to get it duty free. So they were getting the duty free face cream. Just the details of it is hilarious. Shoving the diamonds in the duty free face cream and away they went. But then he realized that he lost control of that. So no longer was that happening. He needed a source of face cream to move the diamonds because he didn't know whether they were, you know, pocketing them as well. So he lost a bit of control there with the face cream. On the other end, does that mean he has to have another guy in on the yeah. web to then give it to the mm. jewellers? It feels like there's so many parts. Well, there's so many moving parts to getting this to the last destination. And I did, I was able to find receipts between, there was a particular diamond dealer in Geneva. His name is Theodore Horowitz. And that family are a very famous diamond family. And in no way are the family part of this, but Theodore Horowitz was known to collect coloured diamonds. So I was able to, through my contacts, see some of the receipts of these diamonds being moved. It's insane that they got away with this scam or this setup for five years, but I guess that's what contacts do. Yes. The reason why there's that five-year window on it is to do with the court case and probably the specifics of their court case. But we definitely know it went for years. Yeah. Do you know, like you would expect maybe something like this, you might do it once, but not, not time and time again. Like they did it at least 10 times. We know that that happened. I want to bring in Barry Crimmins' wife, Lynette, because I feel like with her in the picture, it turns even more into a Hollywood movie. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about how she kind of first realized what her husband was doing. It's quite a scene, actually, this. And I did talk to Lynette and I've reflected quite a lot on the conversations that I've had with her because this whole thing affected her life from what I can see by far the most. And certainly the media attention was absolutely heavily on her. She's a very glamorous lady and It'll be interesting what people make of how we've reported on this. She's a very glamorous lady. When I talk to journalists, they would say, oh, I remember that case, Lynette. She was just so, like, she'd waltz into the room. She had the big blonde hair and she was a pharmacy salesperson. So she worked for Estee Lauder and she kind of had that about her. And she's a very funny lady. I had great laughs with her, I must say, when I was talking to her. So in recapturing when she found out that Barry was taking diamonds, she was doing a job and she forgot something at home and came home to the house. And Barry obviously wasn't expecting her. And she heard the sink running and she put her arms around his waist and gave him a kiss and saw that he was cleaning rough diamonds in the sink in a sieve. And she said, what? I won't repeat the length of what on earth is going on. And he revealed that he had stolen these diamonds for Rodden. And she said, well, I know, you know, we know him. But, you know, you've never trusted him because she also knew Rodden because the dog show thing. So she was horrified in that first instance. But then she decided that she was going to go along with it. There was the big carrot of money hanging over there, you know, like that there would be a lot of money involved. So then she kind of became a courier between the two. So then Barry and Rodden weren't as connected. Actually, she became the courier that would meet Rodden with the diamonds and do the exchange. So she kind of got sucked into the whole scheme by these two men. You could look at it that way. I mean, I, I think what happens later with police with her is particularly awful. But she did. She definitely got involved in it. And it's interesting how she reflects on that now. Now, it does get quite sticky here in that she starts to have an affair with Lindsay. Yes. So herself and Lindsay get to know each other quite well over these coffee dates. And it's very, you know, <laughs> it's so like, you know, that early 90s, you go to a coffee shop, you know, you're not talking about espressos. It's, you know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, you forget even that word coffee shop in some ways. We don't, you know, like we kind of cafe, yeah. you know, it's coffee shop. 
met at a coffee shop and we exchanged diamonds. It's just bizarre. Anyway, so they did really get to know each other. And Lindsay was charming. Everyone said that about him. He was very, very charming. And he'd promised the sun, moon and stars. And he did. So she did end up in a relationship with him. And that relationship ended up going very sour. When did that happen? And and what happened? Was that while this scheme was going on? No, that happened at the tail end. Okay. Their relationship happened at the tail end. And her relationship with Barry was coming to a close at that stage. So she ended up in the relationship with Lindsay Rodden and things go quite south. They don't have this connection with the mine anymore, obviously, because she's split up with Barry. So they try and recruit other people to steal diamonds for them. Ah, I see. So because she's gotten into a relationship with Lindsay, does that mean the connection with Barry stops? Yeah, they basically split up. Right, Barry, okay. Barry and Lindsay split up. So then they try and recruit others to do the same thing. And that doesn't work. And that doesn't work. And then their relationship goes sour. And if finally, it's actually Lynette who turns up to the police and spills the beans. And that's when everything kicks in. That's when they're they're actually charged. That is in 1993. Am I right in saying that in the early 90s, there'd already been two investigations by police by that point? Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't go anywhere? No. And the reason being was the first officer, Robin Thoy, he got very close and he found this nexus, but he feels that he was being headed off at the pass by the senior police officers. And there's absolutely no doubt there was police corruption involved in that. And the second investigation also got stymied and there was a third police investigation. And then eventually it led into a Royal Commission. I know that you got lost in all of this court stuff. You spent many days at the district courts buried in documents. When you actually found out the true extent of all of that corruption and how it all happened, did that surprise you? Because you found some personal links, didn't you? I did. Not to the police corruption. No, 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 no. <laughs> we should specify. I'll let you say yeah. <laughs> Well, I knew a bit about the Royal Commission itself, so I knew it got quite murky with the police themselves. It was the details of actually what was happening in the 80s and 90s that really surprised me in that, as one chap said, that there had to be so many people in the know, and you've said the same, you know, like with air hostesses and this link and that link and that link. So, for example, I went to my local chemist and he's quite a chatty bloke and I'm not shy either. And he said, oh, Sinead, what are you working on? I said, oh, you know, mate, I'm working on this story and this diamond eye story from the 80s and 90s. He went, whoa, I know all about that. And he goes, oh, yeah, no, look, chemists were buying them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I knew Lynette. So it turned out that he had a box seat to the whole thing. So part of the network that Lynette and Lindsay kind of created was not only were they sending diamonds to Europe, they were also selling them here in Perth. And now in Perth, which is also part of what I found out, was that some of these diamonds are popping up in things like cash converters and people are going and getting their diamonds tested and they realize that they actually what they have is an Argyle diamond that may have a bit of a murky past. So the diamonds were distributed not only overseas, but also here. And chemists, because of the connection with Lynette, who worked in the pharmacy industry, were offered diamonds. And this chap that I know said, oh, I was getting engaged at the time. He was at that age, he was in his late 20s. And he was offered, you know, would you like a diamond? I've got a lead on one. A number of chemists actually, although he didn't reveal who did because the stolen goods, but Certainly, that was one network that Lynette and Lindsay pushed into. So the chemist was aware that it was a stolen good? Yeah, he must have been. (laughs) He didn't buy it. Right, okay. (laughs) But he knows those that may have. And some of those diamonds were confiscated. When did the Royal Commission happen? Was that before the trial, before Lynette came to police? No, not till the 2000s. So it was a good decade later. Right. And that the Royal Commission, and it was a Royal Commission into Police Corruption in WA, the whole shebang, because it was the Wild West in the 80s and 90s. A lot went down in WA, a lot, and it happened in Victoria as well, and Queensland. They put a broom through the police, and the same thing happened here in WA, and Argyle was a massive chapter of that. And what came from that? Did we get any answers? Not really. They definitely said that, and I wish I had the exact wording in front of me, but that it was a 
a poor reflection of policing at the time. There was one particular police officer who was part of one of these failed investigations that was singled out in terms of his connections with Lindsay Rodden. But they also reflected on Robin Thoy, had the first investigator who chats a lot in the podcast. And because both Richard Corfield and Robin Thoy, so Richard Corfield for Argyle, Robin Thoy as a police officer, they both had death threats. So it got very serious and Robin Thoy left Western Australia and, you know, he didn't want anything to do with policing after that because he was afraid for his life and his daughter's life. Did Lynette say why she confessed to police or what pushed her to do that? What pushed her was there was a violent kind of interchange between Lindsay and Lynette and that's why she did. She became quite destitute at some point. She had no money. She got isolated from her family. There was huge coverage of of her more so than anything else from what I can see around the time of the court case. And she did go into witness protection. Which just goes to show the time, doesn't it, where, you know, even though it was Lindsay that was the bad guy, it was her that got the attention. Or arguably Barry. Or Barry, yeah. yeah. And it's Lynette that gets all of the fanfare. It was Lynette that got a lot of the attention. And so she was put into witness protection. And while she was in witness protection, she allegedly was assaulted by a police officer. Lindsay went to trial in 1996 and it was for conspiring to steal diamonds, which she told us about earlier. What happened with that? Was he convicted? Yes, he was convicted. The lead up to that, the court documents are unbelievable. He represented himself. Oh, wow. So it makes for very, at times, amusing (laughs) reading. And we do, the little bits of it that you get an insight into that I was able to put into the podcast. But so you've got the culprit essentially interviewing Barry, you know, the people he conspired with (laughs) on the stand And they're just giving it straight back to him. So there's these interchange. And Lynette is a very smart, witty lady. So he's going, so why did you do blah, blah, blah? And she's like, well, because you asked me to. (laughs) And and it is very kind of interesting, you know, interchange between the two. And the judge has no time for it at times. He gets really quite grumpy about it. But although Lindsay was charged and found guilty, he spent a fairly minimal sentence and not what would reflect what he actually did. But it is to do with the charge. It was conspiracy to steal because you can never prove someone stole them. What about Barry? Did he get jail time? When we spoke to him, he said, I never spent any time in jail. He was found guilty. He spent a lot of that time in police custody. But his words were, I never spent any time in jail. That feels a bit suspect. And then Lynette. She went into witness protection. Yeah, so she didn't go into a jail cell. But by the sounds of it, she had a horrific time in witness protection. She did. Yeah, certainly did. Let's skip forward a few decades because just recently a boutique jeweller in Perth found themselves looking at some of these stolen diamonds. How? How did that come about? Well, this is how I got back onto the story because I've known about the story for a while in that I came across it, as I said, when I was like a young reporter. So Rowan Milne, who's one of these ateliers, so one of these exclusive jewellers that get access to the best of Argyle diamonds, got this call to say, these diamonds are going out on the market. They have this great story behind them. They were stolen. And I kind of heard Roan is somebody I know. And I heard about this. I gave him a ring. I said, Roan, what's the story? He goes, yeah. You know, like we're not in the right vintage to know the whole story. And he was super excited about this. So anyway, these stolen diamonds, he put a bid on them and he did actually purchase them. So diamonds that were stolen all that time ago, Rio Tinto had held onto them. They were confiscated by police. They went through a whole period of testing. And I've spoken to the forensics who tested them and I've seen them in the raw and what they look like now. But yeah, so it was just like suddenly like they were all scattered to the wind and suddenly they're available again. At the same time, other people are talking about them testing diamonds and finding them in things like cash converters. It was this kind of strange thing that this story just came around. It's like, well, why is this happening now? But the reason being is they're worth so much. So there could be people listening to this, you know, looking down at an engagement ring with a pink diamond in it, and it could technically be one of these stolen diamonds. Depends on where they got it from. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because apart from that little collection from this Perth jeweller, have we managed to track down any others that are specifically from that period, from that stolen period? Certainly, I've interviewed a scientist who has a lab and he's testing diamonds. 
And also he worked at Argyle at that time. And he said, there's diamonds that are coming to me. There's been a couple now that they should have been because the diamonds are engraved. And, you know, if they're a particular size through the period of time with Argyle, they should have had certain engraving on them. So if you've got a bigger diamond or a more colored diamond or something really special and it doesn't have this engraving on it, why? And this is where it all kind of comes together is, well, why are these kind of mysterious diamonds popping up around the place? We know there was this theft at this time and diamonds were scattered to the wind. I've spoken to the characters involved and know that, you know, the, there's chemists that said, yeah, they were out there. They were, you know, there was a bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge going on, you know, how's about it? I've got a, you know, I've got a lead on a diamond. So they're suddenly popping up and it's to do with the way that they haven't been identified by Argyle. Now Argyle's pulling that right back and Rio Tinto are sending certificates or if you want to get certification for your diamonds now, because this whole thing of provenance is really important to the diamond industry so that way when you or I or anybody buys a diamond that they know exactly where it comes from. I know that you are still so deep in this story and this investigation. So I'm curious to hear, lastly, your thoughts on what has stayed with you from investigating this. To me, every time you talk about Lynette, that seems to be a sore point or like a sadder part of this story. Yeah, certainly. I think it is because I think how journalists have treated women over time has thankfully changed. And to reflect on, you know, on people's parts in a story, you know, like, and you said it yourself, Gemma, you know, there was the man who stole them, there was the man who had the contacts, and there was someone who got involved in it that probably shouldn't have. But yet, in terms of the outcome for her life, it was the greatest outcome from what I can see. And that's me reflecting, you know, what I found out in my conversations. The other thing is, is that it really affected every single character because I spoke to all the people in the box seats in this story. It really affected their lives quite gravely. But at the same time, they all can appreciate this was pure madness. This was a time in my life that I was in a Hollywood movie. You know, it was nuts. And also there's a certain excitement. Like They're like, wow, you know, you kind of think of heists as, you know, something that happens at Ocean's Eleven style. But I was actually stuck in the middle of this vortex that I would never have thought that I would have been part of. But there is a common thread, though, with it all is that I suppose it's that greed that, you know, why these bigger stories happen and that there's a certain greed that makes people reach for things that perhaps common sense, you wouldn't do it. And then where that might end up and how that affects your life as you go on. So that was really interesting too. The other thing about Barry is that he's still a very proud Argyle worker. So when Argyle wound up, they had big party. So it finished up in 2020. So you would think he'd be horrified, but he tried to get to the party, the big wind up for the mine. Wow. Yeah. So he seems quite disconnected with what he did. He seems totally fine with it. He spent his time, he's, you know, it's all done. What about Lynette? How does she feel when she thinks about Argyle and the diamonds? It's deep reflection, quite, quite differently. And all of the other characters as well. I was warned. I was warned by some of the investigators. Dig into Argyle is um, the kiss of death, Sinead. Because that's how it felt for them that it changed their lives so significantly and not necessarily for the better. Although they can appreciate it as a story, the way we're talking about it, that the way it affected them. So the Pink Diamond Heist is very fun and very exciting, but at the same time, there's this other level of you know, human error and human behavior. And for some reason, the thing about diamonds, they're very beautiful and they're very trying to love and you know, all the things we associate with them, but there's this underbelly to it all that is absolutely rippling through this whole story. Thanks to Sinead Mangan for helping us to tell this story. If you'd like to listen to Sinead's full investigation on this case, check out her podcast, Expanse, Pink Diamond Heist. It features first-hand interviews with all the key stakeholders involved. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. Send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au. This podcast was made by Mamma Mia. If you want to support women's media, we'd love it if you became a Mamma Mia subscriber. It costs as little as $5.75 a month, 
For more information, see the link in our show notes.